We are in the midst of a serious financial crisis, and the federal government is responding with decisive action. Executives on Wall Street have escaped punishment for their unethical practices countless times at the expense of the general public. But during the financial crisis of 2008, the ramifications of their actions were catastrophic. This video will investigate the role corporate psychopathy and other psychological factors may have played in the reckless behavior and decision-making of Wall Street executives and bankers that were responsible for the crisis. Purposefully obscured by the elite and regularly misunderstood by the public, high finance on Wall Street has a profound impact on the lives of everyone. It is the axis that connects the biggest financial markets in the world's richest nation and largest economy. Wall Street is often associated with greed, but not just greed for the sheer sake of money, but also the pursuit of gratification from vanity and egoistic admiration of one's ideal self-image. As a result of this, Wall Street is highly attractive to those who crave power and wealth. For generations, aspiring investment bankers and financial advisors have gravitated towards it. High-profile positions in prestigious investment banks are exceptionally competitive and require a certain frame of mind to attain. Those who manage to overpower their colleagues are exceedingly unemotional in their decision-making and masters at manipulating people. They are ruthless, narcissists, not concerned with the needs of others. Corporate psychopathy has emerged as a lens to understand unethical behavior of this manner within organizations. Psychopathy is a personality disorder characterized by behavioral, affective, and interpersonal deficits, including shallow emotions, reduced concern for social norms, and a lack of guilt, remorse, and empathy. While psychopaths are regularly found in the prison population, Many psychopaths are nonviolent members of the community. Research has suggested that psychopathy can even confer an advantage on individuals seeking individual rewards within a corporate setting, which indicates they can rise to the top of organizations. About 1% of the general population meets the clinical criteria for psychopathy, but the prevalence of psychopathy is much higher in the business world by comparison. A range of 3 to 4% have been cited for more senior positions in business. And at the same time, the decisions these people are tasked with making on a day-to-day -day basis have the power to alter the lives of people and families for generations. It was precisely this excessive indulgence in risk, pleasure, and luxury carried out by these individuals that begins the story of the unethical behavior that altered the course of the world in 2008. If you are familiar with the concept of the American Dream, you probably already know that home ownership is often seen as a path to achieving this American ideal. In lovely homes and simple dwellings throughout the length and breadth of the land. A home with a picket fence, ideally white, symbolizing middle-class suburban life with a family and children, large house, and peaceful living. How do you buy a house? Why you secure a mortgage loan from your trusty neighborhood bank, of course. The American mortgage has its roots in the founding of the first legitimate commercial bank in 1781. Once established, a new system of banknotes exchange, governmental interplay, and lessened liability on behalf of bankers caused a ripple effect in the United States mortgage market. Various governmental interventions which sought to provide liquidity for financial institutions, especially loan banks, were established around the time of the Great Depression and World War I when the housing market was suffering. The Roosevelt administration took that intervention much further and in the process radically changed the way homes were financed in America. In his first year in office, Roosevelt created the Home Owners Loan Corporation and the Federal National Mortgage Association, Fannie Mae to help Americans threatened with foreclosure by transforming short-term loans into long-term mortgages. Our economy can yield a potential gross national product by 1965 of about $535 billion. Think what this can mean. It means a $155 billion increase in our economy in just 10 years. A booming economy, favorable tax laws, a rejuvenated home building industry, and easier financing saw home ownership explode nationally, topping 60% in just two decades. In addition to Fannie Mae, another governmental intervention called the Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corporation, Freddie Mac, 
was created when Congress passed the Emergency Home Finance Act in 1970 with the intention to expand the housing market even further by buying loans from mortgage lenders, freeing up their capital for more lending. Under the guise of the American dream, home ownership became a significant economic factor, and by the 1980s, owning a home was a normal part of American life. Home prices rose steadily through the 80s, peaking in 1989 with an average price of $151,000, before sliding to $141,700 in 1992. While the decline wasn't necessarily a national event, and was nothing compared to what lay ahead in 2008, it was still a cause for concern. The slight economic decline prompted President Clinton to reform the Community Reinvestment Act in 1995 in order to help lower-income families who were victims of governmentally designed redlining, which was an effort to provide housing to white, middle-class, lower-middle-class families, while the black population and other people of color were left out of the suburban communities. In essence, redlining was state-sponsored systemic segregation. Clinton's reform of the Community Reinvestment Act added pressure on banks to lend home loans in low-income neighborhoods, which Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac would then purchase to free up capital for banks to lend even more loans. By 2001, the disproportionate influence of credit barriers on home ownership for low-income relative to middle-class Americans had largely disappeared. Even lower-income households that had difficulty raising capital to buy a home were able to secure a loan due to the added pressure on the banks. <laughs> yeah, Allie, you gonna do your standard deal now? No. <laughs> <laughs> Although these changes were seemingly reformed with the best interest of the public in mind, they were heavily influenced by the economic beliefs of the individuals surrounding Clinton. One of those individuals advising Clinton who had a particularly important influence was an economist named Alan Greenspan. Greenspan was the chairman of the Federal Reserve Central Banking System of the United States of America. He was appointed to the position of chairman during the 1980s by Ronald Reagan, and was asked to continue his oversight of the Federal Reserve by Clinton in the early 90s. Greenspan was nicknamed The Undertaker because of his grim appearance. The nickname was given to him by his good friend, the famous Russian writer-philosopher Ayn Rand, who was known for her radical stances on social and political issues. Rand had a profound impact on Greenspan's views and had introduced him to the concept of laissez-faire capitalism. I'm opposed to all forms of control. I am for an absolute laissez-faire, free, unregulated economy. Let me put it briefly. I'm for the separation of state and economics. The influence Ayn Rand had on Greenspan would come to be an integral part of his economic methodology. Greenspan, who believed in unrestrained capitalism, with no intervention from government, didn't just have an impact on Clinton's decisions on housing reform. He also lowered interest rates after the attacks on the World Trade Center in 2001. Wall Street banks could now borrow mass amounts of money from the Federal Reserve for the insignificant amount of 1% interest with the hopes of stimulating the economy. Wall Street banks were also starting to increase their involvement in the loan purchasing market through securitization and subprime mortgages. On any occasion that Wall Street becomes involved in a concept, that idea quickly becomes obscured by a cloak of complex terminology and jargon. This is not done by mistake. It is designed to confuse, intimidate, and bore the average Joe. But in order to move forward, we must gain a better understanding of a few things. So to liven things up, here's Matt Orchard to explain. A subprime mortgage is a housing loan given to people with bad credit ratings or low-paying jobs. This type of loan carries a higher interest rate to compensate for the risk the banks take on by financing the subprime buyer. Subprime loans offer a lower interest rate for a fixed amount of time as a purchase incentive, when in actuality the rate could be quadrupled after the initial low rate expires. This is called the teaser rate. Consequently, the subprime buyer is given no room for error in the event of job loss or an unforeseen circumstance, and is forced to default on their payment. So why does all this matter? The level of risk increased significantly when investment bankers took prime and subprime mortgages, packaged them into bundles, and sold them to investors and other banks as high-risk, high-return financial instruments called mortgage-backed securities. 
Mortgage-backed securities were sold to investors around the world and were an attractive investment opportunity because risk could be mitigated so long as home buyers paid their mortgages. But buyers did not completely understand the risks they were taking on. Investment bankers began to sell billions of dollars worth of mortgage-backed securities through the early 2000s to investors and investors kept buying. But there were a few problems for Wall Street banks that sold these securities because there was only a finite amount of people willing to take out a loan for a house, and the banks were running out of mortgages to load into mortgage-backed securities. The lack of guilt, remorse, and greed associated with corporate psychopathy began to reveal itself when bankers on Wall Street urged loan lenders to target people with low incomes and bad credit and lock them into a subprime loan that was disproportionate to their income level or credit rating by offering them a teaser rate at a level that would almost guarantee that the buyer would default once the rate was changed. This aggressive and unethical business practice is what we now call predatory lending. Wall Street bankers took the subprime loans that were sure to default and put them in a newly created financial instrument that was incredibly hazardous to investors, called a Synthetic Collateralized Debt Obligation, CDO for short. The Synthetic CDO was a type of mortgage-backed security on steroids. They can be made up of a diverse set of assets, divided up into various sections called tranches. Based on the investor's risk appetite, the investment bank would sell them either a low-risk asset rated AAA or high-risk, high-return assets rated B. Whereas mortgage-backed securities were only made up of mortgages, the value and payment stream of a synthetic CDO was not derived from cash assets like mortgages or credit card payments, but from premiums paying for a credit default swap which was insurance on the possibility that some defined set of securities, usually a low-rated tranche loaded with subprime mortgages, will default. In other words, Wall Street banks were betting against the very people they were selling these assets to. At their peak in 2006, approximately $1 trillion in subprime mortgages were securitized by Wall Street. The creator of the synthetic CDO was guilty, as journalist Bethany McLean put it, of turning a keg of dynamite that was subprime loans into the financial equivalent of the nuclear bomb. The introduction of subprime mortgages onto the balance sheets of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, rampant deregulation by Clinton and Greenspan, and the increased use of mortgage-backed securities and synthetic CDOs on Wall Street had set the stage for collapse. If there was one Wall Street executive that played a major role in the imminent crisis that we can examine for the potential of psychopathic behaviors, it would be Richard Fold. Fold was the CEO of the Wall Street investment bank known as Lehman Brothers. He was nicknamed the Gorilla on Wall Street for his competitiveness. People involved with Lehman Brothers stated that he had a I built this company and it's got more value than the marketplace understands mentality. He was ruthless to his competitors and clawed his way to the position he held at Lehman Brothers as CEO. These behaviors established by anecdotal evidence could correlate with the lack of remorse, lack of guilt, and indignation associated with psychopathy, but we will take a more in-depth look later on. Aggressive investment practices at Lehman Brothers under his watch included owning $76 billion in mortgages for mortgage-backed securities 5.2 billion of which were subprime, plus 22 billion in actual real estate. As Greenspan and the Federal Reserve began to raise interest rates in the mid-2000s, the adjustable rates from subprime mortgages began to cause low-income homeowners to default as predicted. The booming housing market began to crumble as demand in real estate was deteriorating, along with the value of the mortgage-backed securities that were sold to investors around the world. Most bankers had turned a blind eye to the warning signs, including Richard Fold, and the match in the powder barrel for the global economy was none other than Lehman Brothers. On September 15, 2008, Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy, involving more than $600 billion in assets, becoming the largest bankruptcy filing in United States history. The bankruptcy triggered a 500-point single-day drop in the stock market, at the time the largest decline since September 11, 2001. Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson refused to grant them a bailout, but the imminent failure of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and other major banks still remained a major threat 
the government's ability to manage the risks of the housing bubble were put into question as the general public fell into a panic. The acting chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, and Treasury Secretary, Henry Paulson, proposed the Troubled Asset Relief Program, which was an initiative created to stabilize the country's financial system by purchasing toxic assets such as mortgage-backed securities, collateralized debt obligations, and credit default swaps. The proposition was passed by United States Congress and signed into law by President George W. Bush. The 2008-2009 Wall Street bailouts cost taxpayers an estimated $498 billion. If mortgage-backed securities are issued and they do not disclose at origination that the original loan amount exceeds the property value that it's stealing, and secondly, would you please describe Lehman Brothers' role in both issuing subprime loans and mortgage-backed securities? I do not believe that any of the original mortgage securitizers uh, knowingly, at the point of origination, would have taken a mortgage whose value was in excess of the value of the home. I find that very difficult. Giving a testimony in court can be an incredibly stressful dynamic. If a subject were to testify and be unfazed by the experience, something was likely done wrong by the courts or alternatively, you would have a predisposition that caused you to experience shallow affect. High stress tolerance, toleration of unfamiliarity, high self-confidence, and social assertiveness are symptoms of psychopathy. The manner in which Fold chooses his words with fastidious care and calmness in this situation is mystifying to watch. To either understand and, or and, believe. And if, it, and if it occurred? If it, if it, if it did occur, uh, I would say it was lack of understanding of what the real value was, uh, but I don't think, I can't talk for the world in general, clearly, uh, but highly unlikely that anybody would do that purposely. That the shareholders or the public should be able to go back in and get a claw back and take those bonuses or additional payments back that are proven with the benefit of hindsight to have been bad decisions for a company and the shareholders. That was actually one of the things I spoke about when I said interesting way to go, go forward is a long-dated compensation system. Uh, in our case, that's exactly what we had. We had a long-dated compensation system. Uh, look, I am not proud of the fact that I lost that much money. It is often said that behavior is a reflection of personality. This abrupt shift in demeanor could be attributed to the intense affects, stormy relationships, and impulsive behaviors that are characteristic of borderline and antisocial personality disorders. Alternatively, from a psychoanalytic perspective, there are various theories that attempt to map the depth of an individual's personality. The concept of the true self is used to describe a sense of self based on spontaneous, authentic experience, unaltered by your environment. The false self, by contrast, is a defense mechanism. The false self rests on the surface as the self presented to the world, but can be recognized as disingenuous and insincere as familiarity grows. But not all parts of oneself have equal claim. Additionally, we cannot assume everyone has access to their true self. Inability to access the true self could theoretically lead to both psychopathy and narcissism. Four to five hundred million dollars is the head of C uh, uh, Lehman Brothers for uh, the last, um, since uh, two 2000 to now. The majority of my stock, sir, came, uh, excuse me, the majority of my compensation came in stock. The vast majority of the stock that I got, I still owned at the point of our filing. The stock is in addition to the numbers that I've uh, uh, indicated, because those were your salary and your bonuses. 
Now, uh, you had bonuses, and, and in addition to that, you had some stock sales. You've lost some money on the stock that you've received as compensation, which you received as compensation on top of these other figures. So you've been able to pocket close to half a million dollars. And my question to you is a lot of people ask, is that fair for the CEO of a company that's now bankrupt to have made that kind of money? It's just unimaginable to so many people. Uh, I would say to you the 500 number is not accurate. I would say to you that uh, although it's still a large number, uh, I think for the years that you're talking about here, I believe my cash compensation uh, was close to 60 million, which you have indicated here. And I believe the amount that I took out of the company over and above that was I believe a little bit less than 250 million. Still a large number, though. Still a large mon yes. amount of money. You have a 14 million dollar oceanfront home in Florida. You have a summer vacation home in Sun Valley, Idaho. Yet you and your wife have an art collection filled with million dollar paintings. Your former president Joe Gregory used to travel to work in his own private helicopter. I guess people uh, wonder. If you made all this money by taking risks with other people's money, uh, y y y you could have done other things. You the large bonus of approximately $500 million Mr. Fold received while Lehman Brothers was on the verge of collapse is unethical not only for business reasons, but for the fact that employees that were laid off were not compensated even though Lehman Brothers was contractually obligated to pay employees they had laid off. This puts into perspective the lack of remorse in his response. Um, you didn't pay out billions of dollars in dividends and you didn't have to pay out these millions of dollars in dividends and bonuses. You could have saved some of these funds for lean times, but you didn't. Do you think it's fair, and do you have any recommendations on fundamental reforms that would bring a new approach to executive compensation? Because it seems that the system worked for you, but it didn't seem to work for the rest of the country and the taxpayers who now have to pay up to $700 billion to bail out our economy. Although most can agree with what Representative Waxman had to say in regards to the unethical behaviors of corporate executives, criticizing someone in this manner is far from the best legal strategy and isn't in the best interest of the public who paid the price for this person's negligence and lawlessness. A more focused approach of eliciting the information necessary for further legal action would have been more appropriate in contrast to castigating the subject on a personal level. This will become evident as the hearing progresses. Did you have any concerns that there may be some uh, arbitrary reasons why Lehman Brothers, facing similar predicaments as AIG, was allowed to fail, whereas AIG was the beneficiary of an $85 billion uh, bailout uh, sponsored by the Treasury Department? Well, I clearly would love to have been part of the group that got. Do you have any, well, do you have any views on that or any thoughts on that? Why you were allowed to fail, you, Lehman Brothers, were allowed to fail and AIG was bailed out? That was a, de that was a decision that was made that Sunday afternoon and no, night. I, I and, know that. I'm and, just wondering. And I was not there. You've got to be wondering. You're the head of this company. You want to keep it going. And I understand from you, everybody knew you were dedicated to the survival of Lehman. Until the day they put me in the ground, exactly. I will wonder. Continuous probing, in combination with the sheer lack of interview skills or direction, has cost the committee any opportunity there was to gain information about Lehman Brothers' mishandling of securities. Empathy and anger are two social emotions that modulate an individual's risk for aggression. Anger is an emotional reaction to threat and frustration. Social provocation has left the defendant, Richard Fold, in a state of restrained anger, yet he is able to keep his composure and give thought-out answers to the subpar examination executed by the committee. The United States House Committee on Oversight and Reform's board jurisdiction and legislative authority make them one of the most influential and powerful panels in the government, yet they were completely intimidated and outmaneuvered by Richard Fold during this examination, and they will not get another chance to question. Uh, and you, if you haven't discovered your role, you're the villain today, so you've got to act like the villain here. But. Uh, so let me now welcome our first 
panel of witnesses for this morning's hearing. We just all made very brief opening statements. Uh, Daniel Sparks, a former partner and head of mortgages department at Goldman Sachs. Joshua Birnbaum, a former managing director of the Structured Products Group Trading Desk at Goldman Sachs. Michael Swenson, a managing director of the, excuse me, managing director on the Structured Products Group Trading Desk at Goldman Sachs. And Fabrice Tor, an executive director in Structured Products Group Trading at Goldman Sachs Engineering. We appreciate all of you being with us this morning. We have a rule on this subcommittee Rule 6, that all witnesses who testify before the subcommittee are required to be sworn. And so at this time, I would ask all of you to please stand and raise your right hand. Our next example are multiple executives from Wall Street Investment Bank, Goldman Sachs. Banks such as Goldman Sachs were promoters of risky and complicated financial schemes that were instrumental in triggering the crisis. They bundled toxic mortgages into complex financial instruments, got the credit rating agencies to label them as AAA securities, and sold them to investors, magnifying and spreading risk throughout the financial system, and all too often betting against the instruments they sold and profiting at the expense of their clients. Got it? 105? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Look what your sales team was saying about Timberwolf. Boy. That timber wolf was one shitty deal. Mr. They sold that Mr. shitty Chairman, deal. This email was from the head of the division, not the sales force. This Whatever was it was, it was a, it's, a th internal, th it's an internal Goldman document. Th this was an email to me in late June. Right. And you sold timber wolf. No, no. You sold timber wolf after as well. W we did trades after that. Yeah. The deal that is being spoken about here is when Goldman Sachs sold $80 million worth of credit default swaps related to AAA and AA rated securities called Timberwolf to an Australian hedge fund and $12.3 million triple B rated debt tied to subprime residential mortgages sold to another hedge fund. These transactions provided a vehicle for Goldman to unload its toxic inventory and to profit from the decline in value of the very securities it was recommending to its clients. Within weeks, the transactions began to tumble in value and the fund began to liquidate within two months. They lost $56.3 million on Timberwolf in less than six weeks. Okay, it's and the trades after. Some you, context yeah. might be helpful. The context, let me tell you, the context is mighty clear. June 22 is the date of this email. Boy, that Timberwolf was one shitty deal. How much of that shitty deal did you sell to your clients after June 22, 2007? Mr. Chairman, I, I don't know the answer to that, but the price would have reflected levels that they wanted to invest oh, in. Oh, of course. They, but they don't know what's a, You didn't tell them you thought it was a shitty deal. Well, I, I didn't say that. No. Who did? Your people, internally. You knew it was a shitty deal, and that's what your and again, e email I, shows. I, I think the context, the message that I took from the email from Mr. Montag was that my performance on that deal wasn't good. And I think the, the fact that we had lost money related to that wasn't good. How about the fact that you sold hundreds of millions of that deal after your people knew it was a shitty deal? Does that bother you at all? You sold a customer something? I, I don't recall selling hundreds of millions of that deal after that. All right, if, let's, let's take a look. Exhibit 166, series of emails. First is June 26, 07. That's after June 22. Top priority is Timberwolf. Your top priority to sell is that shitty deal. Mr. Got my it? comment was I didn't recall the sales. That you got it? That we were trying to sell. Okay, you're trying to sell a shitty deal, and it's your top priority. Come on, Mr. Sparks. Well, Mr. Chairman, Should Goldman Sachs be trying to sell, and by the way, it sold it, a lot of it, after that date. Should Goldman Sachs be trying to sell a shitty deal? Well, can you answer again, that one? Can words, you answer that one, yes or no? Evasion of the question by Mr. Sparks, as we see here, will be a common theme during this examination. The Goldman Sachs executives are fully aware that each senator has a limited time questioning each subject, so they will continue to milk the clock when faced with a question they are unwilling to answer. How can you get comfortable with that collateral? That's a well-known company that 
has a very, very bad record. And what is your response? The response is, hey, we're going short. For reference, to short a stock or a security means to bet against it. A Goldman supervisor responds with a single word after you unloaded $20 million in Anderson notes, profit, exclamation point, Eureka. He later, he didn't, Eureka's my word. He later congratulates the team. Excellent job pushing the closure of these deals in a period of extreme uh, difficulty. Now your clients didn't want to buy Anderson CDOs with that exposure to the new century mortgages, but you still pushed hard. Why did you not inform your clients that Goldman was short on nearly 50% of the Anderson CDO when selling Anderson securities to them? That's my question. Why didn't you tell them you were going short? Mr. Chairman, there are there are about eight emails in here. I, I didn't see the email that suggested that we were short, and I was trying to find that. All right. Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs. See all that? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay, now answer my question. I, I believe this shows the counterparties, yeah. which is Goldman oftentimes Sachs. was Goldman Sachs. That doesn't mean that Goldman Sachs wasn't doing that trade with another client. So it's very difficult for me to say from looking at this, whether we were short or not, we might have been facilitating trades for clients. Assuming you were going short and staying short, let me ask you the question. Should you have told that client when they ask, how are you getting comfortable with this? Should you have told them you were going short if you were? And Mr. Chairman, just so not particular to this, because again, I don't know. In this it. case, I'm asking in this case, you ask a question. How do you guys get comfortable with these kind of mortgages, with this kind of a mortgage broker? Well, again, I don't know if we were I know you don't know. Deal. My question is, assuming you went short, okay, and, stay, and intended to stay short on that deal, that's my question. Should you have then told the customer, asking you the direct question, how can you get comfortable with this, that it was your intention to go short on 50% of the short side and stay that way, if that was the fact? That's my question. It's almost as if Mr. Sparks is incapable of conceptualizing this question in any other way besides a business mindset, when it is clearly a question of morality and ethics. How do you view your responsibility? That's my question, under those circumstances. So, Mr. Chairman, this transaction was a static synthetic, which meant the assets were the assets and they couldn't change. Anybody participating in it should look at the assets themselves. Aren't those assets... Are those assets a, are those open to everyone who buys those synthetics? The specific assets or are they protected? Are those not commercially protected? The specific source? Uh, if that's a legal question, people no. have access to the information, Mr. Chairman. The buyer knows the assets and they have questions about it. The, the buyer is raising a question with you about these assets. He's asking a direct question. How can you get comfortable with these assets from this source? How do you guys get comfortable? Your answer isn't, hey, under my hypothetical, which is not hypothetical, it's factual, but assuming you are going to buy half the short position and keep it, my question is, did you not have a responsibility to answer a direct question? How can you get comfortable with these products from that source by saying, we're going short Half the short is what we're buying. That's my question. How do you view your ethical responsibility? The question being stated here is essentially, if you bet against your customer, do you have to tell them? Are you morally obligated to tell them? Mr. Chairman, and again... The, again, you don't want to answer the question. No, the, the question that investors should and did focus on were whether the names that they had risk to were something they actually wanted at that price. My question, Mr. Sparks, is a very direct question. You were asked a question. Goldman was asked a question. How do you get comfortable with the source of these securities? Instead of saying, disclosing right at that time, but I think you ought to disclose anyway when you're on the other side of a deal. We'll get into that. But instead of disclosing that you had half of the other side of the deal, half the short side, you did not tell them that. Instead, you told your salespeople, keep 
pushing this deal. You had three people turned it down because of the source, and you kept pushing it. But now answer my question. When you're asked the question, how do you get comfortable with these securities, given the dubious source of this security, given the amount, the amount of, this, of how much, how dubious this was because of its source? Problems. I'm going to ask you for the last time, and if you don't want to answer it, you can say you don't want, you don't want to answer it. But clearly, you, you understand it. Did you not have a responsibility when you were asked point blank, how do you get comfortable in this kind of a situation when there's so much exposure to new century mortgages? Did you not then at least have an obligation to disclose, hey, we're not comfortable. We're going selling this thing short. We're going on the short side. That's my question. Do you understand the question? Mr. Chairman, I understand the question. I haven't gone through all of the emails, but the, the, what clients who did not want to participate in that deal did not. This could be construed as an inability to comprehend a question of ethics, or in the very least, an inability to predict the reputation implications of ignoring or being unable to acknowledge such a question. Violating social norms is a common occurrence with psychopathic tendencies. Psychopaths' lack of moral cognition led early researchers to surmise that psychopathy may be rooted in deficits to the frontal cortex areas, generally associated with high-order functions like reasoning and executive control. And the client, client asks you a question. How do you guys get comfortable? It's a question. So what was your answer? Mr. Chairman, we, Did you tell them? We would have had the sales force get on with the deal team and walk through each security <coughs> that they had exposure to and answer any questions that they had about that security. Don't you also have a duty to disclose an adverse interest to your client? Do you have that duty? Do you? About if you have an adverse interest to your client, do you have the duty to disclose that to your client? The question about how the firm is positioned or our desk is positioned? Do you have an adverse interest to your client when you're selling something to them? Do you have the, do you have the, op the responsibility to tell that client of your adverse interest? That's my question. Sure, Mr. Chairman, I'm just trying to understand. No, I think you understand that. I don't think means. you want to answer. But I've taken much more than my time, and we're going to come back uh, to you and to the others on my second round. And we'll turn to Senator Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to start my questioning by asking each of you a fundamental question. Investment advisors have a legal obligation to act in the best interests of their clients. Mr. Sparks, when you were working at Goldman, did you consider yourself to have a duty to act in the best interests of your clients? Senator, I had a duty to act in a very straightforward way, in a very open way with my clients. I technically uh, would expect to investment advice. We were a market maker in that regard. But with respect to being a prudent and a responsible participant in the market, we do have a duty to do that. Okay, you're not really answering my question. I understand the difference between suitability standards, which you did have to follow, versus a fiduciary obligation to act in the best interests of your clients. I understand that you do not have a legal fiduciary obligation. But did the firm expect you to act in the best interests of your clients as opposed to acting in the best interests of the firm? Well, the, when I was at Goldman Sachs, clients are very important and were very important. And so... Could, could I... I'm starting to share the chairman's frustration already, and I'm only 30 seconds into my time. Could you give me a yes or no to whether or not you considered yourself to have a duty to act in the best interests of your clients? I believe it, we have a duty to serve our clients well. I share this information in this video as a scholar of research-based observations of our fellow humans. This particular economic phenomenon is often observed and should be of particular interest to those that are interested in typical forms of true crime content. 
We often watch psychopathic, narcissistic, down-on-their-luck people who are easily apprehended by the law. What we do not spend much time observing is those